hello. Uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, first, a quick word of warning. I have a lot of stuff on my mind, so I'm going to speak pretty fast. Sorry about that. But I want to give you as much as possible in this 40-something uh, minutes. Hope it's going to be worth it. So let's kick off. Phoenix, what is the fuss? It is a web framework, and we already have like a ton of those available today. Some have been around for like many years, even more than a decade, very mature things with a rich and evolved ecosystem. So why even bother learning yet another web framework, especially if it means you need to learn another programming language, adapt to a functional programming mindset, mindset if you're coming from OO, understand some details and working of the underlying runtime, the Erlang virtual machine. So uh, learn a whole new set of tools and libraries. Is it even worth it? Seems like quite a lot. So like a high-level executive summary would be that uh, with the cycle of Phoenix, Elixir, and Erlang, uh, first and foremost, uh, compared to whatever you're using today, currently you should be at the very least able to retain your current productivity level. It should not suffer, it should be roughly the same, possibly even better in some aspects. You will be able to produce simple solutions to simple problems, but also manage complexity as it kicks in. Uh, keep your code focused, concise, uh, and ultimately maintainable. It goes without saying, you will be able to work with other external products and technologies like databases, uh, message queues, and such. Even write some pieces of your system in other languages. If for some special reasons you want to do that, there are a couple of nice ways you can integrate them into your main system powered by Erlang and Elixir. So a lot of options are uh, left open for you. Uh, you'll, you'll get, get some great support for fault tolerance, which will allow your system to uh, operate, operate continuously, provide the service constantly, uh, even when faced with failures. It will be able to reduce negative effects and scope of failures, never go down completely, never experience a total blackout, keep pushing forward, and self-heal automatically to resume the full service. And over time, if your system becomes increasingly popular, you will be able to scale in both directions. You will not need to revisit your past choices and consider some large and painful migrations to other languages uh, or some complex improvisations around fundamental deficiencies of your first chosen technology. Because the foundation of this site, Erlang, has been built for these challenges. It has been built to facilitate the development of complex server-side systems, pieces of software which need to run constantly and do many different things at any point in time to serve the needs of many users. And in such systems, there's a lot of demand for scalability, fault tolerance, distribution, and ultimately high availability. These are the challenges which are the focus of Erlang. These are the challenges it has been solving in production for some 25 years in large and diverse systems in various business domains. The technology is extremely well battle tested and very, very mature. Now, all the superpowers of Erlang somehow revolve around this implementation of concurrency. Uh, the whole idea is that we need to write highly concurrent systems powered by many, many, many Erlang processes. An Erlang process is not an OS process, it is not an OS thread, it is a lighter, cheaper thing, but it is a separate program that runs concurrently to everyone else. Has its own flow of execution, has its own stack and heap, it's even garbage collected separately. These processes are completely separate things, they can only work together by sending themselves messages asynchronously. Um, crash of a process is an isolated affair. A single process crashes, everything else keeps pushing forward without interruption, providing most of your service. But it is not a silent thing. Uh, any, any process can be detected, can be notified about the crash of someone else and can do something about it to help the system repair itself. Now I've said these things are cheap, you can run billions of them on a single machine. And this is what we reach for. The whole idea, the philosophy of Erlang is that we want to run different activities of the system in separate processes. And once you get accustomed to this idea, you're going to find yourself, uh, that there's you're going to find out that there's a lot of potential for splitting the total work across a lot of different activities. Like in my experience, Smaller systems will easily go for a few hundreds or maybe a few thousand of these things. And larger systems, tens or hundreds of thousands, millions of processes are going to be running around at some during some peak time. Yet despite all this massive concurrency, at the OS level, you're going to have just one operating system process, an instance of the Erlang VM, and this is where your system is running. This is where your processes are running, powered by a couple of threads uh, called schedulers, one for CPU core by default, and these schedulers will, of course, spread the load, distribute the load between themselves, thus making your system immediately multi-core capable and vertically scalable. Give it more cores, it's going to use more cores. Schedulers are going to do frequent context switches, like every single millisecond or even more frequently than that. And uh, this will allow, this will give a fair share of CPU time to everyone in the system, but will also prevent anyone in the system, like some super busy, long-running CPU-bound process, from paralyzing the whole system or some significant part of it. You can start a bunch of these instances of Erlang VM. We usually call them Erlang nodes. Uh, you'll probably want to have like one for uh, each machine, each dedicated server. A single function call will connect them into an Erlang cluster, 
and then you can do some nice and funky things such as start a process anywhere in the cluster, send a message to any process anywhere in the cluster, detect a failure of any process anywhere in the cluster, and for the most part, your code will not concern itself with the locality of these things, with the topology of your network. What this means is that purely by uh, the virtue of writing idiomatic Erlang, like highly concurrent Erlang, you'll be heading down the path of becoming fully distributed, although you don't necessarily plan for it upfront. Once you want to cross that bridge, the road's going to be straightforward. Not easy, because distributed is never easy nor simple, uh, but you are on the right track and you're going to get some great support from your technology there. Now, for all these reasons and some others I don't have the time to discuss today, it is sometimes said that in Erlang for 25 years, we've been having first-class out-of-the-box native support for microservices. These Erlang processes are kind of like microservices, allowing me to run a bunch of different stuff separately, spread them across the cluster in arbitrary ways, have them seamlessly communicate to each other and detect failures of each other. And I can do all of that in my main language, in my main technology of choice, within the same project, within the same code base, using just one operating system process uh, for each machine in the cluster, without the need to reach for some more complex, higher level third-party technologies of choice. And my general impression of working with Erlang for some six years now is that there's less need for me to step outside of my main language it's not that we don't do that, and I'm not suggesting that Erlang will give you a full or, or complete alternative to these products. These are great products, they're full-blown, they, they have a great focus, and if my needs are complex, I'm going to reach for them. But if my needs are fairly simple, like maybe I want to have some simple local in-memory cache, maybe I want to run some background or periodic jobs, or I want to have one part of the system state something, send something to another part of the system, there are a bunch of nice ways I can do this directly in my main language. And this will, of course, mean in the overall, I'm going to use less technologies per project. This will simplify my development, deployment, operations, maintenance, debugging, even onboarding of new developers. There are a bunch of wins here across the board. And for me personally, this is a big reason why I'm a huge fan and a very happy user of Erlang. So I made a lot of claims, and I'm going to try to put my money where my mouth is and give you uh, at least make, make at least a little bit uh, concrete these claims through a simple demo, a simple toy project I built for uh, this talk, a site powered by uh, Phoenix and Elixir. So I'm going to show you what does it do, how does it work, then I'm going to do a quick load test, and finally uh, I'm going to walk you through the code. So let's kick off. I'm starting a version build for production, which is the most optimized one, because I'm going to do a load test. A side note, I'm using make here. Um, we usually don't do this in Elixir, I just use it here to save myself a little bit of typing. So that's it, a single OS process running. Uh, one external dependency, PostgreSQL, uh, I use it to read some data, nothing else. Other than that, no pool of OS processes, reverse proxy, Redis, Memcache, the cron jobs, uh, external job scheduler, and whatnot. I can do a lot of nice stuff directly in there. So let's see what does it do. Uh, don't hold your breath, it's nothing spectacular. So it's a very basic, let me zoom this out, a uh, very basic trim down take on this conference site. Uh, the, the data, data is taken off by scraping uh, uh, the official site in about 80 lines of Elixir code, stored to the database, and then I serve it from there. So nothing super spectacular about it. Uh, I support some uh, like RESTful routes, so I can prefix this by, by API, then I can get some JSONs in structured form. Uh, also because I can and also because I should, I'm serving an HTTPS traffic from the same thing, of course, on a different port. And, and technically speaking, this thing has, you know, what you would expect a typical site to have, like, uh, it serves some assets which are bundled, minified, aggrified, uh, fingerprinted, cached in the browser properly. Uh, every single response is gzipped if the client supports it. And to make all that happen, I had to invest little to no work, like set some property here and there, and that's basically it. It's done by my underlying library. Now, as I've said, this thing can serve, this thing is multiple capable, it can handle uh, simultaneous requests, even if they are CPU bound. So we're going to verify this through a simple load test. I'm going to start the test, which under the hood uses a tool called work, WRK, similar to Apache Bench. It's going to issue a bunch of requests to the routes I've shown you and the API JSON counterparts and measure end to end latency and throughput over the loopback interface. So looking at the HTOP, you can immediately tell that all of my CPU cores are busy. The system uses all of its resources, give it more, it's going to use more. It's not maxed out, and this is deliberate. I have carefully chosen parameters such to keep it a little bit below the overload mode. I don't want to test the overload mode because this is not sustainable on a long-term basis, right? Uh, if I'm o overloaded constantly, I either need to optimize or add more hardware. So I'm testing normal mode of operation close to my maximum capacity. And very soon this is going to be over. It's not a super long test. Okay, so nothing super conclusive. Let's not draw too many conclusions here. 
It was a 30 second test, uh, errors are not reported, so everything succeeded. We successfully issued uh, more than 1,200,000 requests, all of them handled by Elixir and Phoenix, making the total throughput close to 42,000 requests per second, with the average latency of 344 microseconds. We are talking about sub-millisecond response times here, and even in the 99 percentile range, we are still well below a single millisecond, with 99 percent of all requests being served in 637 microseconds or less. Now, full disclosure, like every other benchmark I've seen out there, this one suffers from the same problems. It's terribly shallow, biased, flawed, and rigged. I've pulled a bunch of tricks here to improve my numbers as best as possible. Nonetheless, the fact stands, 1,200,000 plus requests were issued, random requests handled by Elixir and Phoenix, proper responses were given, like the ones I've shown in the browser. So this is possible, probably like the most optimistic scenario, still possible. And I want to show you this because uh, I want to dispel some shallow allegations and myths occasionally circling around that Phoenix is, or sorry, that er Erlang is supposedly slow. Now it is true that Erlang does not place raw CPU speed at the top of its priority list and sometimes deliberately sacrifices it to get some other properties which are arguably more important in server-side systems. Nonetheless, my experience of six years working with Erlang tells me that if you use proper algorithms, make proper technical optimizations, don't misuse technology in some terrible ways, in like the vast majority of cases, it's going to be way more than enough. Now you might think that all this concurrency, multi-core distribution, fault tolerance means your code is going to suck and it's going to be terrible to work with it. So I'm going to talk about how it is to work with Phoenix. I'm going to show you the code, but first a little bit about principles. This is a general idea. We have your Elixir project, and like any other project in any other language, it's a folder structure of source files. Phoenix is your dependency, and somehow from the code you tell it, I want to serve some traffic on this port. Uh, now, now what will happen, happen when the request lands, lands uh, the, the library code is first going to create a structure, structure which we call con, like, like a connection. And, and the structure is a record, a bunch of named fields of different values, values uh, different types, types sorry. Uh, so, so the, the library, library code, code is going to populate the fields which uh, describe the input, the request, such as the request path, the request method, headers, IP address of the peer, a host name that was used, and so on and so forth. Then it's going to invoke our code, it's going to invoke our function, it's going to pass the con to us, and the sole task of our function is to uh, return a transformed version of the con with the populated output fields. And then uh, the output fields are, of course, uh, the response fields such as the status, body, uh, headers, cookies, and so on and so forth. And when we return this, then the library code ships it to the client. So it's a pretty simple thing. Uh, there are some fine print variations to this concept, but this is a general idea. Now, a function that takes a con and returns a transformed version of it is called a plug. This is a middleware thing. This is a piece of code that runs in the context of an HTTP request handler. So a plug is a library. It sits below Phoenix. It predates Phoenix. Uh, originally, it has been written by the Elixir core team. And on GitHub, it uh, resides under Elixir Lang organization. And it provides, of course, a specification of how this function is supposed to look like. And will give you a bunch of nice tools and helper functions uh, to work with this con thing. And for the future reference, in this talk, whenever you hear me saying some uh, uh, words of self-importance, uh, some uh, vague terms such as uh, abstraction, middleware, layer, or even plug, what I really mean to say is function. Elixir is a functional language, and we use functions to organize our code. And this is a very simple tool, but very powerful and flexible tool. You can easily combine these things, right? If you have like a function that takes a con and transforms a con, you easily write some generic plug, which is just a function that maybe logs a thing or maybe fetches some session from it, and then you can compose those things in arbitrary ways, and your whole pipeline boils down to that you're threading con through a bunch of functions. In the end, you spit out the final response and you're done. So it's quite easy to reason about and very composable. Phoenix is just a bunch of plugs. As Chris McCord, the creator, will say, it's plugged all the way down. So uh, this is the structure Phoenix proposes. When you use the Phoenix project generator, this is what uh, it's going to generate for you. Uh, I'm going to explain what they do a little bit later in the code. But these things are plugs themselves. Internally, they're going to call other plugs, meaning these are functions calling functions, nothing more than that. And that, that's why it's highly composable, modular, you know, flexible. You can really tweak it however you want to. Uh, Runtime-wise, uh, each request is going to be handled in a separate Erlang process, uh, or more precisely, a connection. So like I have 1,000 people at the same time, I'm going to have 1,000 of these things. And this will leave a lot of room, a lot of potential for the VM to spread the load across available hardware and also to isolate crash crashes like single handler uh, crashes, everything else keeps running without interruption. So that was the theory. Time to take a look at the code, a uh, brief code walkthrough. 
first things first, the entry point to my system. So this is a module. Uh, module is uh, like a namespace. Functions reside in a module. That's it. A collection of functions. This is like my main function. This is where I'm starting my system. And uh, uh, this thing here starts uh, like a, a top level supervisor. It starts the processes of my system. Or more, pr more precisely, it starts services which comprise my system. And whenever you hear me saying the word service, I either mean to say process or processes. So my system consists of two services. Uh, the first one called repo is related to the database under the hood. I'm going to have this is going to run a pool of processes. Each one will connect to the database, keep a socket open to the database, and I can use those things to issue a bunch of concurrent queries to the database. I don't have the time to discuss database access at all today, uh, but a quick note, it's not of concern of Phoenix. There is a separate library which does that, which is called Ecto. Uh, the second thing starts my site which is further subdivided into sub-services, if you will. Um, so this is what I have. Cache, in-memory, in-process, uh, uh, lazy-style application-level uh, on-demand cache with expired final item, completely self-sufficient, standalone, no need for other external dependency. This thing here is a needless complication. I don't need the cache at all here today for this project. The only reason I have it is to improve my load test numbers, which, by the way, would be more than enough even without the cache for this particular scenario. Many people will tell you, don't use the cache until you can prove you need it. Um, this thing here is going to start, the endpoint is going to start processes which are, in fact, listening on the given ports, in this case, HTTP and HTTPS. And then I have two things related to chat functionality, which I didn't show you. We're going to take a look at this a little bit later. Uh, distributed, eventually consistent uh, chat history, and the collection of present users, people who are present in the chat room. Now, I want to make it perfectly clear that this startup workflow is not specific to Phoenix. This is the way we are starting any Elixir project or even Erlang-based project for that matter. So the Phoenix does not somehow magically take over your project. It is a framework, you use it as a library. Add it as a dependency, start it where you want to, when you want to, if you want to. Right, so here this decision is hard-coded. I could also make this decision at runtime whether I even want to serve the traffic or not. And nothing prevents me from running multiple endpoints for example, like that there's an admin endpoint which uh, listens on another port which I maybe don't want to expose to the outside world. A bunch of options here left for you. The startup procedure is explicit, straightforward, and completely under your control. Now, uh, all that said, once you have an endpoint running, uh, it serves some traffic. A uh, library code is going to create a con, and the first place you get your con is the endpoint, which is, I said endpoint is a plug. You can tell here this is a module, so a quick addendum. Module can also be a plug. In this case, in the module, you're going to have a well-named function, which is going to be involved. So again, ultimately, the function is a plug. Uh, it none, of it is none of that can be seen here immediately. So instead, what we have, we have a bunch of these like plug, uh, like constructs or declarative constructs or statements, if you will. Plug something, plug something else, and uh, so, so on and so forth. Um, so basically, what I'm specifying here are uh, plugs, most of them coming from the plug library, which are going to be, uh, my con is going to be threaded through these plugs. Um, so what happens is after compilation, courtesy of Elixir metaprogramming facilities, this module is going to get a well-named function, which is going to actually do the job. So the endpoint is the first place where I do something with the con. I specify some general level processing, which I want to do with like probably every request. So the first, very first thing I do, I invoke plug.static. This thing here is going to serve a static file from the given paths. If the request path is one of the given paths, it's going to serve from the given location, maybe gzip if the client supports it. And the way that works, just to make it a little bit more concrete, in plug.static we also have a well-named function. This function is going to be invoked. It gets the con, and it takes a look at the con and makes a decision. Do I want to serve the, do I want to serve the static or not? If the answer is no, it just returns the same thing it got, untouched. If the answer is yes, it populates some output fields. It will also set some Boolean flag like hold to true, thus indicating that uh, no need to go further, and that's it, and we're done. So this is the general idea. Some other things happening in the endpoint, uh, I will not explain everything, but you know, just to give you a taste of it, the logger thing is going to use Elixir's logger facilities to log uh, the data from the con. This is a thing I added myself, which is going to uh, do a in-memory lookup to serve from the cache if possible. Um, for example, this thing here is going to transform the con describing the head request into a con which describes the get request. And like the final thing I have is the router. So if I came here, I didn't serve a static, I didn't serve from the cache, so I'm going to just forward the thing to the router and we're going to make some uh, further decisions there. Now, 
This code here is, uh, other than the cache thing, pretty much uh, verbatim copy of what uh, the Phoenix generator will generate for you. Ultimately, just cherry pick some sensible defaults for you from the plug library, mostly. Uh, but it's your code. You can literally tell from the first moment what happened with your request, and it's completely tweakable to your own preferences. I can literally nuke all of this stuff, and I can do something like plug my function and define a private function. My function that has a plug style signature, it has to take the con and some option, and I can use a plug library, for example, to uh, transform this con by setting a status and by setting a body. And in less than in less than 10 lines of code, I can have the smallest possible Phoenix server, no routers, controllers, layouts, views, templates, and whatnot. It's highly trimmable, it's highly modular, and uh, this is what makes it, in my opinion, in Elixir world, a one-stop shop for anything. Whenever you want to do some something HTTP-oriented, look no further than Phoenix. Now, the next thing is the router. So the router is also has this declarative feel. Uh, it's it's going to be the plug in the same style. A couple of things happen here, but I'm going to focus on the gist of it. So the gist of the idea is uh, what you would expect it to be probably. Based on the request method, like get, post, put, and so on, and based on the request path, I'm going to forward the request to a controller, which is a module, and an action, which is a function in that module. This is it. So let's take a look at how am I serving the single talk. The request has to be a get. The path has to be a slash talk slash column. ID. So this column thing indicates a placeholder. In the actual request, I can have uh, whatever. It's going to be a talk ID. And in the action function, it's going to be then available somehow under the name ID. So we move to talk controller function show. Let's go there. Talk controller uh, function show. So it has a plug style, func plug style signature. It takes a con and params. This thing here is going to be a key value. In there, I'm going to have the ID, which corresponds to the talk ID, because I've explicitly specified it in the router. Now, this thing here is very, very uh, uh, you know, small and spectacular, as I believe it should be. Essentially, what I'm doing is I take the talk ID, and then I invoke something from the rest of my system. So uh, at this point, I depart Phoenix, and I go to something else, which is completely Phoenix agnostic. You know, so Phoenix is like a top tier to my system, just making it HTTP, HTTP oriented. It's like uh, allows me to implement an HTTP interface to my system. So under the hood, this thing is of course going to go to the database, fetch some data, and return to me the structured data. In there, I'm going to have data about the talk. I'm going to have a speaker, and uh, once I get that, I'm rendering. Render is a helper function from the controller. Boils down to two things. First thing. The render is going to invoke something from the view layer. And as I said, layer is a function. So it's going to invoke a view function, pass some parameters, and view function is going to return a string, which is a body of response. Uh, and then the render is going to populate the con, set the body, status, uh, response, uh, uh, content type, header, and we're done. At this point, we are done with the plug chain. We are returning the transform con. So how do I render? What, what do I have here? Uh, this thing here is a template name, and these are some additional arguments. So there is a template file. Uh, talk HTML, EEX, let me just find it. So EEX, standing uh, for embedded elixir, meaning precisely what it says on the tin, a text file with embedded elixir expressions. So, for example, this thing here is embedded elixir expression. In there, I have talk in my scope, and the reason why I have it is, it is because in the controller, I passed it explicitly under the given name. No, no particular magic about it. So this thing here is going to produce the HTML snippet, which we are returning to the uh, controller and the render function then populates. Now, a quick note, uh, the template file is parsed during compilation. So again, courtesy of Elixir metaprogramming facilities, uh, what happens is uh, this thing is parsed, and after compilation, uh, a function is going to be generated in the view module. So there is a talk view module. I already have some functions here which help in dealing with JSON. This is, in fact, all the same function, has the same name of render. Uh, this is uh, an example of pattern matching in Elixir and Erlang. Think of it like a switch case. Uh, so based on the first value, the value of the first parameter, I'm going to go here or there. And after the compilation, somehow we'll also get another clause here, something like this. Uh, and of course, the code of this clause is going to be somehow derived based on the template. So this is it. Now, the point I'm telling you this is because if you don't like templates, maybe you think they're too magical or you don't need them, you can just use the functions in the view module. So again, a lot of options there. If you don't like views and whatnot, uh, you can, for example, just nuke this and use, for example, HTML to send somebody. Or you can use JSON to set 
to send some data which is going to be encoded and proper headers are going to be set or you can always fall back to plug so a bunch of uh, functions in plug I'm showing you just one of them a lot of options there uh, at your disposal so you know whatever you don't like or you don't need just ditch it and use what you can take or what you can what, what is useful to you and that's, that's it, that's, that's all I have about request response style processing. Uh, no time to wait, so I'm gonna go further and we're gonna take a look at uh, real-time communications, so uh, WebSockets. And these days everyone has WebSockets, so it's so 2016, so I'm gonna spice things up by making it distributed out of the box. I'm starting two Erlang nodes now, two instances of Erlang VM of my system locally, uh, so there are two always processes, they're listening on different ports. Um, they are immediately connected into an Erlang cluster, so here I'm node 1, and in the list of my connected nodes I see 2, likewise it's always symmetrical, so I'm node 2, and I see 1, and so I have an Erlang cluster established here, these things communicate through a TCP connection. Of course, uh, normally you will want to run them on separate machines, as I've said. So we have this thing, let's take a look at the chat. Um, it's super ugly, I have to warn you, I suck at designing terribly. Um, so here I am on node 1, I'm going to name myself Joe, uh, so you can tell here, now let's zoom this thing. You can tell here I'm Joe at 1, the list of online users show only me, I could send some message but there's no one around. So let's give Joe some company, I'm going to head on to uh, a different port, so it's 580 now, I'm heading on to node 2, uh, I'm going to name myself Jose, and I see Joe online, so Jose at 2, see Joe at 1, I can greet uh, I need to keep track of my multiple identities here and Jose on one sees this message from uh, sorry Joe on one sees the message from Jose on two and he can of course read back so this work distributed out of the box uh, you will have to do zero work for that to happen Phoenix will make it happen um, no external dependencies at all this thing is completely self-sufficient no single source of truth no single single point of failure and we're going to verify this um, I'm going to issue, uh, I'm going to uh, create a split brain or a net split, if you will. So here I'm on one, and I'm going to disconnect two. That's true. So now in the list of connected nodes, there's no one around. Vice versa on two. So now we have your typical uh, split brain scenario. Two nodes are functioning, they cannot talk to each other, but the load balancer, in this case, this is me, like a manual human powered load balancer, can forward any request here or there. So how does this work? Let's go back to the browser. Um, Joe at 1 now doesn't see Jose anymore because Jose is on 2, likewise Jose on 2 doesn't see Joe anymore. So let's give them some company. I'm going to head on to node 1, to the chat area, and I'm going to name myself Robert. And I'm Robert, I see online Joe who is on the same node, and I can talk to Joe normally, so node 1 provides some service, and likewise Joe can respond. Of course Jose sees nothing of this. So let's add some company to Jose, I can here name myself Chris, I see Jose, and again, this thing works on node 2, oops, uh, hello, uh, who am I greeting, Chris, right, so we see these messages, this is your typical available system, right, so it provides a service and it doesn't even lie to you, so like wh wherever I land, I'm going to actually see just a list of users I can talk to, so this is pretty, pretty nice, uh, now I'm going to, now I'm going to reconnect this thing, uh, let's just reuse the previous statement, so I'm going to turn this connect into connect, I'm again fully functioning, the cluster is healed, going back to the node 1, Joe at 1 sees missing messages from node 2, he sees the complete list of online users, and now he can talk to everyone. And on node 2, likewise, Jose sees missing messages, sees all users, sees the uh, new message from Joe, same thing, Robert at 1, Chris at 2. Okay, so how do we work with this thing? Um, right, so there is a thing called socket. It is an abstracted two-way connection between a client and the server. Uh, so under the hood you can run different transports to make the socket happen. Uh, like, of course, obviously web sockets or long calling or anything else. And socket acts as a medium. Once this socket is established, then you can have, or the client and the server can have multiple uh, separate conversations, which we call channels. So channels are two-way asynchronous stateful conversations. Like uh, uh, in a chat, chat server, server, let's say uh, as a user, user I'm in five rooms, rooms I'm going to have five channels, channels open, open on, the on the single socket. socket. So, so that's the idea. idea. The, the dance, dance goes like this, a client initiates a connection, connection server accepts, and then we have a socket, and then a client can join a topic. Topic is an arbitrary string, like whatever, it has to have some meaning in your own application code, right, to the server and the client, like room, 
uh, one, two, three, or, or lobby, or whatever. Or whatever. And once, once we, 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 are we have successfully joined, joined we, have we have a channel. channel. So, so this is the manifestation of the client on the topic. topic. Um, once, once we have the channel, channel they, can they can exchange messages. messages. Each, Each message consists of two pieces of information. The first one, string, we call it an event or an event name which has, has some meaning in your code. code. The second, second one, one, payload, payload is a key value, value which is some additional info. info. So, so that's, that's it. it. Uh, uh, Runtime-wise, these things are running, running in separate processes. processes. Like, like again, again I'm, I'm joined on five, five channels. channels. I'm going to have on the server, server one, one process for my socket connection and one for each channel, channel which again leaves a lot of room for the VM to spread this thing and even to isolate crashes. Like if a single channel conversation uh, crashes, crashes, I get, I get all, all my other conversations, conversations are still left intact and, and can still keep going. going. And, and because the crashes are detectable, are detectable, this is going to be propagated to the client, which can maybe render this info or retry the connection. In the code, client-side code, client -side code uh, there is, of course, uh, JavaScript client library for the Phoenix Channels protocol, available out of the box, and there are libraries in other languages as well. So the gist of the idea is uh, I create a socket on some path. Uh, the, uh, the server, server has, has to accept, accept socket connections, connections on this path. path. Uh, obviously, obviously, I need to configure, configure this in the server. I'm going to show you this in a minute. Once, Once I have the socket, I can uh, uh, join a topic, or I can or create a channel on some topic, topic and, uh, and send, send some, some payload while, while I'm joining, joining like maybe my username, username or something, something of the sort. Once, Once I have the channel, channel essentially two things I do. I can either push a message, push an event with the payload to the server, or uh, respond, react uh, when, uh, when some, some event from the server with an associated payload arrives. Right. That's, That's it on the client side. side server side, maybe, maybe you've seen it earlier. Uh, uh, in the endpoint, I declare a socket at some path, path and I specify the module, module which, which, which is going to somehow further power this socket. socket. Uh, uh, it, goes it goes without saying, saying you can have multiple sockets on the same endpoint, endpoint obviously on different paths. The socket module further specifies transport seed supports. Out of the box, WebSocket and long calling are provided. Uh, you, you can, can write, write your own, you need to write a module, module that satisfies some contract. contract. And, then and then I'm mapping topics to channels. channels. So, so it's, it's like, like simple routing. routing. Uh, like, like topic lobby, lobby is going to be powered by the lobby, lobby channel, channel and topic room, room colon whatever is going to be powered by the room, room channel. channel. And the, and the channel, channel module is then the one which on the server side powers this conversation with a particular client. It's a callback style module, so I have to have a couple of well-named functions there, which are going to be invoked in some particular events, like when a client joins first, or handle in when a client sends a message, or handle info um, uh, when any other Erlang message from any other process in the system arrives. And essentially from these functions, again, two things you can do. You can either push or broadcast. Uh, push means that uh, we're going to send a message to the client, uh, because, because always the channel or the server responds to some client. client. And, and broadcast, broadcast means we're going to notify every, every single channel, channel process in the system, system which is on the same, same, same topic. topic. Like, like I'm the I'm channel for the room 1 to 3, three. When, when I broadcast, broadcast every, every channel, channel for the room 1 to 3, three, three is going to be notified, but no other channel. channel. And when, when I say every, I really mean every. Under the hood, Phoenix is going to leverage distributed capabilities of Erlang to send a notification to all processes in the Erlang cluster. Broadcast, broadcast, the first, first uh, variant uh, notifies, notifies everyone, everyone including myself, myself broadcast from everyone, everyone excluding myself. myself. That's the only difference. Uh, notification, notification is sent in the form of an error message, message, and the, the default, default implementation is immediately going to propagate it to the client. client. So, so I broadcast, broadcast and this event and payload goes to every client by default, overridable of course. And, and what this means is that the gist of a simple chat server boils down to this. In the, the client-side client code, code, you respond to some UI events, events like, like enter key being pressed or button being clicked, by, by pushing a message with some payload. Obviously, Obviously this payload, of course, has to contain the message text at the very least. And, and I'm, I'm also responding, responding to the same event, event user message, uh, by, rendering by rendering this payload somehow on the UI. UI. Server-side, Server handling, we just broadcast it to everyone who's event in the payload, goes to the client, it's going to work. So that's it. Um, time, um, time to wrap, to wrap this up. up. Uh, uh, let's, let's take a step, step back. back. So, so what, what I've shown you here is uh, extremely, extremely simple. simple. I'm not even going to pretend that it's super spectacular. spectacular. You know, no, just, just a couple, couple of features, and already I have a little bit of services running around, around like, like uh, local, local in memory, memory cache with some expiry, uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, chat history, and uh, 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 collection of present users. But of course, powering the conference means much more. There are a bunch of other stuff I can do. And I can do this in the same project. I can add additional services, which are processes. I can run additional endpoints. And of course, wherever it makes sense, I'm going to reach for other technologies and services, like maybe payment gateways and whatnot. But I can 
start from here and move it really far. But this is what I call a simple solution to a simple problem, uh, but very flexible solution gives me a lot of options, and uh, it's built on a proven technology that has a proven capacity to take me very, very far and allow me to keep my sanity in the process. And this is for me the win-win situation. I don't see much trade-offs here, and that's why there is no doubt in my mind that today when it comes to building a custom web-facing backend solution, the stack of Phoenix, Elixir, and Erlang is the best tool for the job. This is the tool I use, and this is the tool or the stack I recommend. A couple of onboarding tips. Basically, go to official sites and go through tutorials. They are excellent. Uh, go through all of them. First, the Elixir ones, then the Phoenix ones. You're going to be able to get your hands dirty pretty quickly. Um, after that, as usual, your search engine of choice is your best friend. A bunch of resources out there paid for and free, blogs, books, videos, casts. Um, and, and definitely, definitely sign up to elixirforum.com. It is a great place. Uh, do, not do not hesitate to ask your questions there, uh, no matter how simple or trivial they might seem. Uh, people are super friendly and helpful. You might even get your answers straight from creators of Phoenix, Elixir, and Erlang. A little bit of self-promotion. I'm the author of one of the books uh, on Elixir. It's not about Phoenix at all, but it is about the language and about concurrency. It has a big focus on how to use this concurrency and adapt to this mindset to get, to get all these great benefits of Erlang. 40% off at manning.com. I have four, uh, two hard copies and two e-books uh, as a giveaway present here. So no special raffle. Uh, people who are asking questions get the first dibs. So if you want the book, just say you want it and you're going to magically get it. Uh, if, uh, if something, something is left, left then, then find, find me uh, later, later and, and uh, I'm I'm I can give you I can give whatever I have left over. over. Uh, uh, please rate this talk, talk uh, uh, give me the feedback, give me your feedback, feedback let me know what works and what I should improve. And that was about it. Thank you.